This may sound like an odd question, but have you ever tried to push a rope? Uh, think about that for a minute. How about a chain? We're trying to push a chain. Have you ever tried to uh, have the experiences of folding up a large tarp? I do it quite often at work. <clears throat> and you know what's interesting when you think about that, you can only pull it. You pull the corners together, and then you pull one side over the other. If I try to push that tarp into place, it doesn't work very well. Um, and that's pretty much what this message is about today. So when you think about the concept of the title of my sermon, he will lead if I will follow. Think about the rope and the tarp. In our relationship with God, it doesn't work very well when we try to lead. It doesn't work very well at all. You know, I had Corey, uh, I asked Corey to read the, this particular uh, passage from Matthew 18 uh, because it demonstrates perfectly when what, what we have to become like in order to be in the kingdom of God. So let's go through it just a little bit. I have it here on the PowerPoint. Let's pick it apart a little bit. Let's ask some questions about it. Matthew 18, verse 1. The disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So what's their focus? What's their focus? Well, the good thing is they do have a focus on the kingdom of heaven. That's a good thing. But they want to know who is going to be the greatest there. You know, we talked in the Sabbath school this morning. I mentioned that uh, it might be me, the last one who sneaks into the kingdom with the pearly gates closing right behind me. And, you know, that would be okay that would be okay because I would be in the kingdom of God at that point. Uh, it's, it's, it's been told to me quite often, the person who goes to college, goes into medical school, and they graduate absolutely last in their class. There might be 500 graduates, but they graduate absolutely last in their class. What do they call that person? They call him doctor or her doctor. That's right. Now, I'm not sure I'd want that person as my doctor. <laughs> but um, the focus of the disciples is important here. They, I think they do have a mindset of the kingdom of God and in Christ. But may their, maybe their focus isn't placed exactly where it needs to be. So Jesus told us that he always spoke to his disciples and, and to others in parables. And so he uses a child to speak in, a, in this parable, parable way. So going on in verse 2 and 3, Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So let's think about this verse three. Jesus said they needed to be converted. Well, that's a reference to some sort of change. In other words, what they had asked him, the whole focus of what they had asked him needs to be changed in order for them not to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, but it says, you shall not even enter the kingdom of heaven if you don't have this conversion. But in the middle, he says, you have to become as little children. So I thought in my mind as I was going over this text, 
what could possibly be good about being a little child? <laughs> what, what attributes does a child have that God would think would be good? And the one thing I came up with is a child follows because he knows nothing else. Think about that in the context of putting our lives, of following and letting God lead us. A child and his mother, a child and his father. You know, uh, my daughter is teaching preschool this year. And it's only a half-time preschool, so she only has to put up with these little kids for half a day. But they're young enough where they pretty much believe anything that she says. These are four-year-old kids, okay? And anything that the teacher says, pretty much they believe without question. I think that's an attribute that Jesus wants us to have in reference to God. You know, when there's a school teacher sitting here, so you know, I may be speaking out of turn, but you have a lot more experience with kids than I do. But what happens to kids when they get a little older? They start getting away from that, I believe, what the authority tells me. And by the time they are probably in fifth or sixth grade, it's probably difficult to teach them in a way that they will absolutely believe what you are saying. They have a questioning mind. Well, a questioning mind is not so bad as long as we put it in the context of the ultimate authority, and that is Jehovah God. Let's move on. In verse 4, Jesus says, Whoso ever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. Do I believe that I know it all? I'm in a difficult place if I do. The same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Christ is asking his followers to follow even more deeply. Christ is promising them that if they humble themselves and look to God for the answers they need in their lives, for their focus, then they will be great in the kingdom of heaven. So I think as you go on through the text, Jesus' references to these children, but really the reference is to those who will humble themselves. But who shall offend one of the little, these little ones, in verse 6, which believes in me? It was better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. You see, if we become like little children, we will be if we become like little children and humble ourselves as Christ referenced, and then if, if someone else receives that same message because of our witness, that's what I think Christ is saying in verse 5. Who shall receive one such? A little child in my name receives me. Someone who has humbled himself. Well, I was looking for these particular concepts in Scripture. And I noticed that in almost every account that I could think of in the Old and the New Testament, every account has elements of humbling ourselves before God, no matter who you talk about in the Old Testament. To be a, a worker for God, to be God's instrument, we have to our humble, humble ourselves in some respect. To be led by God, we have to have an element of following him. And what he wants from us more than anything else, I believe, is to realize that we rely on him for everything, for our very lives. After all, he is the one that created us. So I turned in scripture to a, a, a an account that I appreciate a lot. I turn to uh, First Kings and the account, the accounts there 
of Elijah. And I just want to go through a part of those accounts and let's see what we can glean from the scripture there. Uh, if I can get the clicker to work here. 1 Kings chapter 18, 17 and 18. So Elijah is the prophet of God. And uh, let me just give you a little background. Uh, there's not a very good king. <clears throat> He's named here in this passage Ahab. And this king, knowing full well and better than to marry outside of Israel. That's what he did. And he married a woman that was full in apostasy, worshiping false gods. And because of that, Israel had gone downhill quickly. So here in the middle of the account, when, when God is sending Elijah to talk to Ahab and to try to get Israel back on the narrow road, Here's what happens. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Are you the one that trouble is troubling Israel? So let's think about Ahab's mindset for a second. Does Ahab believe that it's Elijah that is giving Israel all this trouble? That's what it seems like. So his theology, we might even say his doctrine is skewed, wouldn't we say that? That's putting it in modern terms. But Elijah is patient with him. But he, he answered and said, verse 18, he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Or <clears throat> if you don't know what Balaam is, it's, it's just a word in reference to false worship specifically in the area of the false god Baal. So Elijah does set the record straight, but gently. And, and Elijah's being very patient. I want, I'm pointing out here that Elijah is following what, what, how God has led him. So let's, let's continue. Now therefore, Elijah said, send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the Groves, 400, which eat at your wife Jezebel's table. And so Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. Look, Elijah knows and understands that there's a decision to be made, that there's a witness to be made for the one true God. And instead of Elijah saying, look, God is just going to kill all the prophets of Baal and he's going to set things straight. Elijah knows that God has a witness that needs to be spoken before all the people. So Elijah is instructed to be patient so that people can make their decision for the true God. Verses 21 and 22. Elijah came unto all the people and he said, How long are you going to hesitate between two opinions? If Jehovah be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Why do you think they didn't answer a word? They had a decision to make. They had a decision to make. Maybe it's they'd been so long in apostasy and been directed by their king and queen that they should worship this false god and should go into all these practices of the false god. They weren't sure. And Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of Jehovah. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Look, I might point out, and it's going to become evident in the rest of scripture that we read, that Elijah was not the only one that had stood up for the true God at this point. But I think Elijah is trying to, that's what he believed. That's all Elijah knew. But Elijah's going to be set straight later on. 
He was trying to tell the people, look, there's so many, uh, there's so many false things, so many false people on this false side, worshiping this false God. And that doesn't mean that it's the right way. Even though we look out at society and there's so many people believing a certain way, it doesn't necessarily mean just because this person we respect or that person we respect doesn't necessarily mean that that's the true word and doctrine of God. Verses 23 and 24, 1 Kings 18. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood but put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And call ye on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of Jehovah. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Look, Jesus told us that it was an evil generation that asked for a sign. And I believe that. But sometimes people need something to base their faith on. God doesn't ask us to believe with blind faith. He gives us enough evidence in scripture and in, the na in nature around us to understand what he wants us to understand. So let me have you turn to this passage in 1 Kings 18. We're just going to read a little more right out of our Bibles. 1 Kings chapter 18. First Kings chapter 18, and I ended up with verse 24. All the people said, it is well. They were ready for this showdown between the gods that Ahab and Jezebel had brought into Israel and the one true God. Um, and Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, verse 25, choose you... You choose the bullock you want and dress it first for you are many and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. And then they took the bullock, which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning, even until noon. Let me just point out something that I noticed in this. You, you know, a sun worshiper will worship the sun. When the sun comes up in the morning, they will worship at noon and they will worship in the evening. That's a symbol of the Trinity God. And it's interesting that Elijah speaks here. He speaks in the morning to them in reproof. He speaks at noon in reproof. And when the day is done, time of the evening sacrifice, he prays to God. So he's specifically rebuking this sun god, the, the triune god at this point. It's very interesting. So in verse 26, he says... Uh, from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us, they said. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leapt upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noontime that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking or is pursuing or he's in the, on a journey. Or peradventure he sleeps and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets, till blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midnight was passed and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that they, there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. Verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of Jehovah that was broken down. Verse 31, and Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of Jehovah came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of Jehovah the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put wood in, the, in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. 
And he said, do it the second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. You think this thing's going to burn with all that water on it? What's interesting is that God had said it wasn't going to rain. God had caused a famine to come upon the land. And here they were up on the top of a mountain. And these people are asked to bring four barrels of water and then four more barrels of water and then four more barrels of water. First of all, where are they going to get this water? And then they've got to haul it all the way up to the top of Mount Carmel. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God of Israel. Isn't that interesting speech? Let me read it again. Jehovah God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. So the God of our forefathers. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. See the difference between of and in? <clears throat> in that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. See, this is how I know that Elijah was following and letting God lead him. Hear me, O Jehovah, hear me. Why? He tells us why. That this people might know that thou art Jehovah God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Ah, uh, this clicker's not working. Then the fire of Jehovah fell, and it consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they finally got their sign, didn't they? They fell on their faces and said, The Lord, that's Jehovah, He is the God. Jehovah, he is the God. Really, I hope that uh, we, we don't need a sign that dramatic. Truly, I think God wants us to believe from what he's given us already. <clears throat> He wants us to follow. He truly does. You know, there's another account in Scripture that just multiplies these things tenfold when we think about following and letting God lead. Following and letting God lead. And it is really it was a no-brainer to me about someone who was called by God and asked to do something and didn't quite want to follow where God led. And that is, in the Old Testament, it's the account of Jonah. I mean, it's just very, very simple. And, you know, I think this is one of those Bible accounts that just about every Christian has an understanding and a knowledge of. So maybe what I'm about to tell you and what I'm about to share with you is not anything new, but it builds my faith to go through these things about following and letting God lead. So my next slide is here in Jonah, oops, Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> you see, we all know the account. Jonah was a prophet of God. He was called to go to a specific city, a specific area, and warn the people that God was going to, unless they turned around and repented, they were going to be destroyed because their cup was filled with iniquity. Well, Jonah, for some reason, didn't want to go that direction. He didn't want to go. I believe there's, there's some nationalism involved. I don't think Jonah wanted to go to this other people, this other race of people, and preach about the one true God. I think he thought, you know, I'm 
good enough here where we are in Israel. We believe in the one true God and they can do what they're going to do, you know. So we bought a ticket on a ship that was going pretty much the opposite direction. And God, through his providence, made Jonah realize that he wasn't following. So here he is. He's in the fish's belly. And finally, at that moment, I think he realizes that I've got to follow where God is leading me. That God knows better than I do. So think about the practicality of this. Think about being in a fish's belly. That's what it says. And some people have said, well, it, it was a whale. Well, you know, today we say a whale is air breathing, so it's different than a fish. It's not a fish. But I'm not sure they had that understanding back then. Anything that was in the ocean was a fish. Okay? So evidently it had to be big enough to swallow Jonah. And we know that there's whales and there's fish big enough to swallow Jonah. Here he is inside this fish. And that's when he comes to the point, you know, it doesn't matter where we are. God is leading up to us to the place where we have to ask ourselves the question, am I going to follow and let him lead? Verse 2. I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord. What is that saying? Things got so bad for Jonah when he was following his own way and his own thought process, his own witness, that they became an affliction to him. And even though I'm where I am, he says, I cried to Jehovah and he heard me. That's a miracle in Excel. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and you heard my voice, he says. For you has cast me in the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed around me. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. In other words, Jonah is attributing all the bad things that happened to him, that God had a hand in those things. Why? To bring him around so he would follow where God wanted to lead. Can't you see that in your own life? I can see it in my own life. God has allowed me to go through things, go through struggles, grow through hardship of my own choosing so I could get to the place where I'm finally going to say, he has a better plan for my life than I do. In verse 4, he says, Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. You don't even see me anymore, God. I'm sure, because look at where I am. How could you possibly see me where I am? Yet I will look again towards thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depths closed round about me. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars were about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Jehovah my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered Jehovah. A lot of times, we have to be brought to the point where we can't handle it anymore to finally let God lead us. And my prayer came in unto thee, unto thine homely temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. I had to throw this last text in there. Because really, it's an important lesson for me. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. It's a lie that I speak to myself when I think I've got it all figured out and I can handle it. And in doing so, when I speak these lies to myself, I forsake the only mercy there is for me, and that's from God's hand. The lesson of Jonah speaks to me somehow. It speaks to me that I need to follow and let God lead.
So going on there, Jonah says, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is right upon us here in this country, you know. In all things give thanks, the scripture says. Even in the place where Jonah was, he knew enough to thank God for preserving his life and not giving up on him. I will pay that which I have vowed. In other words, I'm going to say what I'm, I'm going to do what, I'm, what I've said I'm going to do. Salvation is of Jehovah. And then Jehovah spake unto the fish, fish verse 10, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. <laughs> I threw that in there because it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, in, in, in everything that happens to us, God is trying to effect a change in our lives so we will follow him. That's the point I'm trying to make. And we see, look, you can find this just about on every page of scripture. It's really an easy sermon to get up here and preach because it's a concept that God has trying to, to struggle inside of us. I think since the very thought of sin came into mankind. So let's go back to Elijah. Elijah was successful in convincing the people through the miracle of God on Mount Carmel that God is the true God, that Jehovah is the true God, and there is none but him. And at the end of that day, all the Prophets of Baal were slain. Israel's on the right path again, back to worshiping the true God. But you know, somehow Elijah got a little mixed up in his understanding. And he, when the threat came personally to him, I believe he panicked a little bit. And he ran. He ran quite a ways away. He even left his servant behind at one point so nobody could track him. And he ran, he was gone. The, the scripture says in this particular back passage, he, he, he was gone for 40 days and 40 nights. But God knew where he was. And we come to this text in 1 Kings chapter 19, 9 and 10. And he, that's Elijah, came to a cave and he lodged there. And behold, the word of Jehovah came to him. And he said unto him, what are you doing here, Elijah? I have work for you to do. You're not following. What are you doing here? Verse 10 is a very interesting verse. L look carefully at what it's saying. And he said, that's Elijah, I've been very jealous for Jehovah God of hosts. In other words, I I've done my job. For the children of Israel are forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy, thy alt altars, <clears throat> slain your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's, he's, we're being led into his mindset, what he's thinking. There's a reason he ran away. They're seeking his life, even after he's done all these things and stood up, stood up for God and followed God in his leading. But let's look at what happens next. And he said, God said, go forth and stand in the mount before Jehovah. And behold, behold the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and broke it in pieces in the rocks before Jehovah. But Jehovah was not in the wind. And after the wind and the earthquake, but Jehovah was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. What do you think is going to happen next? <clears throat> and it was so when Elijah heard it, that's the still, small voice that he wrapped his face in his mantle. He knew the voice of God. It wasn't in the earthquake, wasn't in the fire, wasn't in the wind. 
It was the still small voice. And Elijah went out and stood at the entrance of the cave and behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now remember we read verse 10 already. This is the same exact verse, only it's labeled verse 14. When God said the second time, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah says the same exact thing that he said in verse 10. And he said, I've been very jealous for Jehovah, God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down those altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I even, I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. What's God trying to tell him? You got to follow. Elijah, if you follow, I will lead you. And then I think Elijah gets it. Because God says, Return thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you come, anoint Hazael to be the king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be a king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of I'm not going to pronounce that. Shall thou appoint to be a prophet in thy stead or in thy room? God gives him instruction. And then God says, It shall come to pass that him that escaped the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escaped the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. God is saying, I've got it all under control. Anybody that doesn't worship me, now that the decision has been made to worship me, they're going to be put to death. And I've got it all under control. You just need to follow Elijah. And then he says, as proof of all this, I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees of which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Elijah, what you thought... You were the only one left. What you thought is not the case. You see, sometimes we have excuses inside of ourselves. What I think is the right thing. And I'm going to head out on my little journey to my, do my little witnessing because I know that my, what I believe, that's right. Sometimes God has to stop us in our tracks. And it may not be by the wind, by the earthquake, or by the fire. We need to be listening to his voice to know how to follow him. So I, I'm, my thoughts are going to turn to the New Testament at this point. You know, at night, uh, Jesus had some people come to him. Here's one of those accounts. One came to him saying, good master, what good thing shall I do that my, I might have eternal life? And he said unto him, why do you call me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. And that's a whole other sermon. Let me keep going. But if you will enter in life, keep the commandments. Now let's what, listen, listen to what this man said. And he saith, which one? And Jesus says, you shall do no murder, commit adult, not commit adultery, not steal, not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth. What lack I yet? See, the young man understood that there was a way. There was a way. And yet, with all his own understanding, even with his study, he knew that he lacked something. What was it? Jesus said unto him, If you will be perfect or complete, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, that you shall have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. 
Jesus said, come and follow me. What are we willing to give up to follow the way that God has made for us? What are we willing to give up? With this man, it was his possessions. Was he, he was not willing to give those possessions up. If I'm going to follow Christ, if I'm going to follow the Son of God, the way that the one true God has set before us, I've got to be willing to give up everything. You know, what we know and understand isn't necessarily the way that God, the things that aren't necessarily the things that God wants us to know and understand. My, my understanding in myself sometimes is skewed so much by what I believe and what I think and what I've been taught to know and understand that God's got to retrain me. That's what we learned with Jonah. That's what we learned with Elijah. What Elijah thought is he was the only one left, but that wasn't true. What this young man thought, I, I, I've, I've done everything that I need to do. And when, when it was pointed out to him, he, what he needed to do, he couldn't make that choice to follow. Even the disciples, they witnessed Christ's death, his resurrection. Let, let me point something out to you from, I think it's the first chapter of Acts. Now, Acts is the book right after the Gospels. The disciples had witnessed the resurrection. They had a chance to put their hands in the holes in Christ's hands and side. And this happened after that. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, not many days, with Christ's own spirit. That's going to be poured out onto you, but wait here. Wait here for it. Well, listen to what disciples' response to this is. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? You know, what the disciples thought, even after witnessing all these things in Christ's life, his death, his resurrection, all these things, their focus was still not where it should be. Their focus was still on an earthly kingdom. Their focus was still in a place where they were thinking their own thoughts. They still were not following completely. But Jesus said, look, you just need to follow. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons, in verse 7, which the Father has put into his own power. In fact, Jesus demonstrated he didn't even know everything that the Father knew. That was okay. Because he said, the Father only knows when that time will be. Jesus said, but just follow what I'm telling you. Wait. You will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses for me. We're both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other most parts of the world. In other words, there's going to come a point where you will follow. Friends, I hope you can apply these lessons to your own life. I looked at what's happening in my life with these examples in the scripture. That it, it, it's true that many, many times, not just day to day, but moment by moment, am I following the leadership of Christ Jesus in my life? And I'm, am I relying on him to make the decisions that I need to make? God wants to lead me but I need to be willing to follow in every respect.